You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey Vet Rehabbers, it's another one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice Podcasts and I'm chatting with Deanne Zanoni from Tops Veterinary Rehabilitation in Illinois, United States. So this was a bit of a strange one because we had some major technical difficulties where my internet completely dropped and so I recorded the first part of it and then the second part was right in the middle of this corona craziness that we're in and so we decided to just change the tact a little bit and actually talk about how Deanne was handling um, this coronavirus and how they're doing curbside consults. So it's a little bit of a mix of two different types of interviews, but I think very relevant at this time. And I think you guys are going to really, really find the information that Deanne shared really valuable for all of you. Welcome, Deanne. Thanks so much for joining me. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. Deanne, won't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got into the field of veterinary rehabilitation? Um, My story is actually kind of interesting. So I went to school at Michigan State. Um, I at that time wanted to do exotics and zoo animal medicine. So that's kind of what I focused on. Um, I moved to Chicago for my first job and it was a 50% exotics practice. Um, And I loved it. It was great. I had a great time. Um, And I had my heart dog was an English Mastiff and she was kind of the biggest limb in there ever was perfect vet dog. Um, Everything that could go wrong certainly went wrong with her. She um, broke her toe and I had taken her to the surgeon and they were managing her toe, but of course she got pressure sores and broke through casts and splints and things like that and just never quite healed. So one of my clients had told me about this place called Tops and they had recommended it for their animal. So I made an appointment and then my dog fully tore her cruciate. So we had to go to surgery before I could make that appointment. But then after surgery, I was so worried about her rupturing the other one, she was a year and a half old, that I decided to go for that rehab consult and see what they had to say. You know, I had nothing, I knew nothing about rehab at that point. So I brought her in. Um, It was a great evaluation. Dr. Lori McCauley was actually the doctor who did my dog's eval. And I think I just asked the right questions and they offered me a job. So I was like, all right. I know I fell into it. It's so unusual. People are like, how did you get into rehab? I'm like, well, my dog broke herself and I just kind of landed in the right place at the right time. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll do that. So I, before I'd even started, I signed up for the acupuncture training. I went through IVIS and I was reading the notes and it was talking about the yin and the yang and the flow of chi. And I just looked at my husband at the time and I was like, ugh, I don't know what I got myself into. Like it was so foreign to me. Um, but I went through and I did my acupuncture training. I, started here at Tops and kind of learned a lot of rehab on the job with Dr. McCauley being an instructor at CRI. We kind of just decided to to throw me into the deep end and and see how it went. So I did my acupuncture training. Then I did my chiropractic training at Healing Oasis. And it was hard because I finished ACU on a Sunday. If anybody's taken those courses, they know how much studying it is. I started the chiro course on Wednesday. So it was, it was a lot of learning. but it was really, really great. And I really enjoyed um, learning all of the things that I could do and seeing the difference that it made for my patient. Um, so I actually, I worked here for three years at Tops, and then I went off to have kids and do that sort of thing. And then I found my way back recently. So I've been here again since July um, and it's been great. Yeah, it's such a different way of thinking, right? Um, mm-hmm. I know also, you know, I actually did Western scientific acupuncture. Um, so I know there's the Avis is the Eastern approach, right? It is. Yeah. I tend to practice more Western. Um, I've yeah. just kind of morphed into that because I didn't really see, they didn't have a lot of the classes back then that they did now. Because mm-hmm. I mean, that was 13 years ago. Um, but the Eastern is interesting. I find it interesting. I just, it's not how my brain works. Yeah, do you think that's just the way that we were taught at university? It's just a completely different way of thinking? Maybe. And it's also how, like, how this practice is set up. I think if I'd been in a different practice where they focus more on tongue and pulse, it's just not, 
it takes me like 10 times longer to do that. And the flow of the, this practice was not that way. So I couldn't take that time to dedicate it to looking up each case and kind of thinking it through. So I think I just lent more towards the, the Western aspect of things. So now you're back there and you're working again. So you, how many staff are there? So how many therapists and how many vets are there? Right now we have two and a half doctors, but we're shortly going down to two. Um, we hope to come back to have three full-time doctors as soon as we find somebody that fits in and wants to, to come join us. Um, we also have three therapists right now. Um, and I think we're looking to add one more once we get another doctor in. And is it a, a is it a primary rehab practice or do they we do are rehab first only? Opinion? Okay, so no, no first we are rehab only. No, correct. Okay, all right. And and then who runs the practice? So you're obviously employed there. Are you responsible for doing any of the management, or do you, are you lucky to have a practice manager? We have a practice manager. We actually have two. Um, we were recently, I think, last year this time, we were purchased by a corporation, uh, Pathways. So I missed a lot of that transition but from what I understand it's been a very smooth transition it's not always the case when corporations take over um, but it's been really good and the it runs really really well and I think they are really open to staff ideas and questions and and we have me regular meetings to kind of help with that sort of thing. When you first um, started doing rehab I mean often we think to ourselves are we going to sort of progress into having our own practice is that something that you've thought about or are you quite content with um, just um, working for somebody because you don't have to go that route you know there's a lot of challenges around owning your own practice and you know I, I remember when I had my practice sometimes I used to just think oh I just wish I worked for somebody and I can just do what I love to do and treat animals. Yeah you know it's, and it's one of the most common questions people give me or ask me, and I have never had an interest in open, owning my own practice. I like that I can go to work and then I can go home and I can leave work there. Um, I, I know the headaches. I've had friends who've opened practices and it takes them five years before they're profitable and they've had to work two or three jobs to kind of support that. And, and I've seen that and I, I commend them for the hard work that they do. But for me, I like having a not being a solo practitioner I really enjoy having somebody to bounce ideas off of and to talk to and and to come to with difficult cases because they can sometimes look at it from a completely different perspective that I can so I've never I've never been one that's really been gung-ho about owning their own I like my vacations too much yeah and tell me do you get to have a say as to what happens there I mean because obviously mm -hmm. A lot of the things that are happening, there might be big decisions that need to be made. And if there's a sort of a, if it's a is it a corporate type of um, ownership? Is that what you, you mentioned? Yeah, so it's a yeah. corporation. So there's obviously different um, ways to go about getting equipment and things like that. But the day-to-day -day running and management is very open to different ideas. And when I came back in July, I came back with like a wrecking ball. I came in with lots of ideas of what I liked at the last practice that I was at that was rehab only. I had ideas for our records and our, and our exercises. And so I kind of came in and, and changed a lot of different things. And everybody was super open to that, which was awesome because it's a lot of change. And this new person's coming in that half the staff didn't know. Half the staff knew me already, so it was kind of easy but half the staff was like, who is this person coming in and making all of these changes? And Dr. Christine Durek and I, we um, look at things very differently, We're, which is great because we make a really good team about things. Um, but me coming in and I'm like, no, I want this exercise done this way and this is why I do it. So it was a lot of learning for all of us, but it was really great. Also when great minds come together, everyone's got different ideas. Yeah. Um, it usually works, right? Right. Usually, you know, again, it's one of those things that it's the right staff, the right atmosphere, the right culture. And, and it, it's important to find that for a job that, so that you love it. Yeah. It sounds like you've got a great team there. I've been really lucky in the rehab world. I just, I've really fallen into some great situations, some great clinics, some great staff that is just phenomenal. And I love that. Let's chat a little bit about the equipment that you have. Um, so one of the challenges I often hear from vet rehabbers is, is um, the flow between the underwater treadmill room and um, the consultation room. So how many underwater treadmill, uh, treadmills have you got? We have two underwater treadmills. So the way our practice is set up is we have two different areas. So if you walk into our practice, you go to the right, that's our consult room. So we have four exam rooms. And then if you go to the left or yeah, you go to the left, then that's where our gym is. 
our gym is set up so that there's two underwater treadmills and an L, and then there's some ramps and an open gym area so we can share that space with three or four people, although it does get a bit crowded. Um, we just have to be more aware of if there are dogs in the treadmill or we're bringing in that are more dog reactive, then we have to try and set up blocks and things like that so that they can't visualize each other. Um, but it's, we have a fair amount of space, so it does work better than some practices that are, have smaller pool rooms and things like that. So the gym room, basically, lots of people are in there at one time, so you don't have yeah, to book, so book a room. Correct. So our gym, again, we can have two underwater treadmills going at the same time. We can have a gym session going where we're doing exercises, or we could even have, we do have another room off to the side of that one that where we do our laser, our shockwave. Um, we have a HACO med machine. So all of those treatments, theoretically, we could do four treatments at once in that room. Um, it gets a bit crowded, again, depending on the dogs and things like that. We're recording this podcast, actually, I think it's like two weeks ago, um, maybe a little bit over two weeks, and my internet crashed. And so we had actually planned just to keep on and carry on with our conversation, but a lot has changed in two weeks, two and a bit weeks. And so due to COVID-19, everything sort of we plan, I just thought, you know, let's chat about how Deanne and her practice are handling the situation because I think it's so relevant now. And I think that everything Deanne is going through and how they're handling things um, is really going to help the rest of us because some of us are in lockdown now and we are going to have to eventually go out and start practicing again. Um, Deanne um, and her practice are actually in it now, so they're practicing. So they are doing what they call curbside practicing. Um, so Deanne, thanks so much for joining me again. And um, yeah, I'm looking looking forward to hearing like how you are working things um, there with this um, corona craziness. So tell us a little bit about how curbside consulting works. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's ever changing at this point. Every week we seem to get new information, new rules, new guidelines. So it's been evolving over the last few weeks for sure. Um, we're grateful that we're considered an essential service. I know some of the states, um, the, some of the rehab practices are, are affected a little bit more. I know one that's at least one that's closed, um, considered non-essential, but for us, we're focusing mostly on quality of life, pain management, um, things like that. Our surgeons aren't doing as many surgeries right now. They're more kind of streamlining for critical patients, orthopedics where the dogs are really struggling to walk, fractures, things like that. So they will do some traumatic ACLs or CCLs, um, but they're not, you know, the dog who's been limping for 15 months and the owner just decided they want to finally do something about it. They're not going to cut those right now. So they're, they're trying to prioritize for things. So the way we have it set up is it is curbside, meaning that nobody's allowed in the building client-wise. Um, one of our staff members will suit up in PPE. They have a mask, gloves, goggles, and a gown. They go out to meet the client. Um, the client calls in. When they get here, they take a history and a credit card number over the phone. The staff member goes out to get the dog. They aren't allowed to bring anything in the building, so no paperwork, no leashes, no collars, anything like that. So we put our collar, leash, or harness on them outside. The owner takes theirs off, and then we bring them in the building. Once they're in the building, we have uh, certain rooms that they can go in. We've kind of taken out all of our furniture, anything that isn't necessary, so it's one less surface for mm -hmm. us to have to clean or to worry about the virus um, attaching to. Um, and then when we go in, we'll work with the patients. We have to wear masks because we're within six feet of each other and they're moving towards us having to wear masks uh, the whole day that we're in here. So I'm, I'm in a closed room right now. So I've got my mask off so you guys can hear me. Um, then each patient is then brought back out the same way with our staff and PPE. Most of our communication is over the phone. So the receptionist will call, get the credit card payment, make any further appointments, Myself, or the other doctor, or even the therapist, they're either going to text the client. So we have an iPad and I use iMessages for most of my clients that have apples. So it works out really well. Um, if they don't, we'll call them or send an email and just kind of communicate that way. It's worked out pretty well so far. Um, most of our clients are grateful. We send pictures and videos of things that they're doing. Um, we are still doing new evals. Again, we're focusing more on the evals that needed at this point, no maintenance, no maintenance chiros, no maintenance swims, athletic swims, things like that. Um, so we are, what we'll do is we will call them on the phone for the initial appointment. Before I go in the room, I review the history, 
Um, I talk to the owner about what the process looks like, what I'm going to be doing in the exam room with their pet, and then I call them after the appointment and let them know what I found, what my concerns are, where I would like to go from there. Everything I talk about, I always send in a report later that day, so that part hasn't really changed. Um, just think that it's important to go over everything verbally with clients because it's a lot of information. We all know that, you know, you're kind of throwing 50,000 things at them and and getting them to process all of that is hard, even on the phone. Um, I know some other clinics are doing telemedicine for that. They're actually doing a video chat to talk about history, physical exam, kind of watch the dog walk in its own environment, and then coming in, doing the exam, and then doing telemedicine after to go over things. I'm okay with either. You know, I think it depends on the client. All of them can pick up the phone and have a conversation. There are some clients who struggle a little bit more with technology and video chatting. So I think that for now that that's kind of how we're going to do it. The last two weeks, we've focused mostly on um, pain management modalities. We've canceled all of our teaches. So need, no teach range of motion, no teach massage, no teach exercises, which is really a struggle because so much of what I do, I want my owners to be involved. I want these animals to be doing these things every day. And so I've scheduled more exercises in-house and massages in-house, but these owners are home. They need things to do. They're, you know, they're getting in trouble with their dogs. I just had somebody yesterday who was like, oh, I think I walked my dog too many times. It was nice out. We wanted to go outside. Now we sore. I'm like, oh, well, let's do that. <laughs> so if I can give them specific exercises, range of motion, massage, things like that, that can work. So what we're thinking of doing is making it kind of an hour-long appointment. So the first 15 minutes will be us kind of working through things, feeling the dog, checking massage, uh, feeling range of motion. The next 15 minutes are going to be more of like a video. So we're going to video us demonstrating the, the procedure to the client. And then a day or three days later, we're going to call and have a video chat at that point so that they can demonstrate back to us um, the procedures. Because the thing is, is that I've never been one that really likes to send exercises home unchecked because so many things can go wrong. You know, that dog could be doing that sit to stand completely wrong and it's a waste of an exercise or they could be hurting themselves. So I always want to see the owners perform the exercises. So this is the way we kind of came up with my therapist wanted to make sure she saw the dog and, and performed it on the dog herself so she could make tweaks and techniques. So that way she could better inform the owner. So we, we've kind of tried to mesh the two together. So we're doing a little bit of in-house and then a little bit of telemedicine so that we can kind of address all of the angles for things. So that's what we're going to start moving forward with um, to try and cover those pieces as well. I think that mostly clients are pretty grateful that we're still here and we're doing things because some of our patients need weekly therapies. We have a, some that are twice a week therapies and, and that's just something that they need to maintain. Um, we of course have clients who are stressed financially because they're not working right now. Their job security is low. They're not essential employees. So we do have some clients who are like, well, I can't come in until all of this is over. But then it, we have we have a responsibility to those pets to try and talk those through those owners as much as we can. So the one that walked her dog too much yesterday, she can't come in. So I've refilled her Galloprant for her dog. We've talked about icing. We've talked about uh, a sissy looping because that's something that I can have shipped to her and she can do pain management wise at home. So it's just switching the focus a little bit to help those patients as well, even if they can't come into the building physically. And those clients, I mean, are, are the ones that are coming, are they nervous about coming and making contact or, you know, are they sort of just focused on getting their dog to you and they're okay with it? Um, I think there's a mix. I think the ones who are super worried about it aren't coming. Um, I think some, there are some that still don't like aren't phased at all. And then we have some that come in, in their own gloves and masks and, and protect themselves. But because our staff is in PPE, we're protecting them as much as we are protecting ourselves in that situation. You know, there's yeah. no sustained contact. So it's under five minutes, it should be a minute or two. There's, they're not taking history. They're not talking to the client about things. They're literally, you know, everything is done over the phone. So it should be a quick switch. We may hand them a piece of paper, but we're not taking anything from them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, well, every once in a while I had a client who was a little bit grumpy the other day because he had paperwork from the, from the specialist and we wouldn't take it. I was like, could you just take a picture of it and send it to me? Um, and that was a little bit, I think, you know, stress runs high. 
But I think in this day and age, we're really lucky with all of the technology that we have, you know, the video formatting, the pictures that are easy to send and how easy it is to, to have this curbside um, capabilities with our clients is great. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, you must have to have some like change in your systems and have some strict boundaries and rules. So for example, like no taking any paper or anything apart from a number or whatever, you know, from your client. Um, and those are things that um, vet rehabbers that are going to need to start thinking about now because mm -hmm. their staff are going to be in a position and they're going to have to say, sorry, that's not the protocol. Like we can't do that. Yeah. And then also I'm just thinking about all the changes in how things have happened, you know, in your systems, you know, and then mm -hmm. three days later, you're having to make connection with them again yeah. on video. And like, how, do, how do you fit that in? And probably at, right now, the amounts of cases that you're seeing is decreased because you're not seeing all those maintenance cases. Mm -hmm. But like, how will it work when you are? <laughs> this is like one of my things. I just think like, like you have to like completely change the systems of your practice. If yeah. you're going to carry on with curbside and then still be doing maintenance treatments and running like seeing the same amount of patients, is it even possible? To, I don't to think it is. You, you need more support staff. So I think that you could still be as busy, but your overhead is going to be higher because we need people to run dogs. So, and, and we're trying to keep it to one or two technicians or staff members to, to have uh, client exposure. And we're trying to keep that person with that dog. So Carrie doesn't take this dog out, but then Alyssa bring that dog in because now two people have had exposure to that patient. And so we're trying to limit that as much as possible to try and reduce staff exposure. I know when they're making appointments, they're trying to space it out. We've added a little bit more catch up time in there. Um, pretty soon we're going to be going to two different teams with our um, scheduling. So it's going to be even harder. We're probably going to adjust our hours and we're going to have to move clients around that are already scheduled. Um, but basically it's going to be one doctor, two doctor's assistant and a treatment person along with a receptionist on each team. So what team A will work certain days, team B will work certain days. And even on those teams, we're going to try and keep it segregated. So let's say the doctor and the doctor's assistant get exposed and they're out. The treatment people can still see appointments and, and try and keep things running. Um, so it, it's definitely going to be a lot of rescheduling. And our clients, again, for the most part, there's always outliers have been really um, okay with us calling and rescheduling things. You know, we've already had to schedule, move things from April to May and it, who knows you know our quarantine is potentially up the end of April we might have to move it further you know or we might have to stay curbside for longer um, so you know if we have to change our schedule now we're going to have to be calling a lot of clients and say okay well we only have one treatment assistant or one treatment therapist right now so we're going to have to move these appointments or cancel your appointments and reschedule to some other day or we have one doctor this day but we have two doctors worth of appointments so there's going to be some finagling that goes on. So our, our reception staff and, and my, man, medical, my medical director are doing a great job of trying to keep up on top of things. Um, again, we're pathways. So we're a little bit lucky at this point because we have such a large team of people. We have people at the top and the information is kind of trickling down. They see how things are changing in different parts of the country. So if any time there was a time to have the benefit of a corporation, unfortunately it is now, you know, certainly the smaller practices are gonna, gonna have a lot more trouble with this, with, with having lower uh, income coming in, but higher overhead. It's, it's, it's really gonna be a struggle for a couple months for all of us and, and potentially even moving forward, depending on economic recessions and things like that. We aren't considered essential in that respect, um, but, I think there are still going to be a lot of clients who, because of the love of their pet, they're going to do their best to, to try and keep going to some extent. But again, we might have to pull out more of the icing, the medications, and the sissy loops for the people who can't come as regularly. So how's it working now? Have you actually like set a date, let's say in May, that you're actually booking normal appointments still. So like you've moved appointments to May. So let's say it's yeah. whatever the date is. And yeah. then if it gets extended, then you just keep moving those. Okay. That's pretty much what we're doing. And that's kind of what my massage therapist is doing. Um, she's trying to keep it in order of people she's canceled. You know, we're going by what our governor is saying is 
through the end of April is quarantine. So the people who were in the beginning of April for her get to have first dibs for May appointments, and then she's moving down the line. So we're kind of doing the same thing as, all right, well, now we have you here, and now we're going to push you to this day, and we'll see if we can keep that appointment. But we're going to try and keep it as regular once we're out of this as we can. And I have a feeling some of our maintenance Cairo dogs, they're maintenance for a reason, right? They're not essential, but at some point they're going to start needing that maintenance because they're going to start breaking. So I think we're going to have to kind of start bringing those guys in periodically as well. Yeah. I mean, it's so frustrating, um, you know, for the therapists, for all the yeah. work that they've done and, and just that feeling of just helplessness now, you know, mm -hmm. not being able to see your patients and, 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 you know, we all know we've got a few patients that if we don't see them, they, you know, what's going to happen to them, you know, yeah. um, it's, yeah, it's, it's really hard. It's really, really hard. I mean, they're obviously for you guys, it's nice that you're able to see those ones that, you know, really need to be seen. Um, mm -hmm. But for those therapists where lockdown um, is, is full now on and they, they're not able to see any patients. Um, but could I you guys potentially do telemedicine um, and talk those clients through some, some basic massage, some icing? I think some of those things that we forget um, yeah. that we can do pain management wise, even just allaying their fears and talking to them and saying, oh, maybe you shouldn't do this. Or, hey, what about like avoiding stairs in your house for the next couple of weeks? Because we know that's something that does that. So I think you can still, even being completely unlocked down, reach out to those clients because A, they're still your clients and they're going to appreciate it. They're going through the same stresses that we are right now. And maybe you'll think of little things that can help them and, and that will help build your practice in a different way. You're so right. You're so right. That, that's what each and every vet rehabber should be doing. They should be mm -hmm. making contact with their clients. And I mean, some of them, they'll be able to charge a teleconsult for, so they'll be able to do a little bit more. And the ones that, that can't afford it, it's just a touch base. Like, how, yeah. how are you doing? You know, are you okay? Um, you know, is there anything that I can help you with? Even if it's just a short five, 10 minute um, mm -hmm. conversation. So you, yeah. yeah. Or just say, you know, right. Send an email to your clients and say, hey, I'm going to check in on you. If you want to have a phone con phone consultation, I'm happy to do that. Here's a charge or here's not a charge or under five minutes is free, but anything beyond that, you know, there's going to be a charge for it potentially, but yeah. reach out to the clients, touch base with them, let them know that we still care and we're still there to help them. And I think that that's going to be great for everybody, morale, for our pets, for our clients, for ourselves. Yeah. I mean, because as you say, you know, um, they still are clients and in the end, yeah. you know, they, we want to keep them, you know, and Absolutely. we want to maintain, maintain their pets. So there is a vet we have in the United Kingdom. She came up with a great idea. What she is doing is um, she's actually contacting the vets that refer to her mm -hmm. and um, she's actually offered her services. So she said, I know that you're inundated now with dogs with mobility issues. Please, you can give them my telephone number. You can give them my email. I will make contact with them. I will help them. I'll advise them about environmental changes that they can make yep. and try and help them from a physio uh, perspective um, how to maintain their dogs during this time um, and completely free of charge, um, which I think is a wonderful thing to do. I mean, first of all, you're supporting those vets. Those vets mm -hmm. are struggling now. They've got reduced teams. They're doing emergencies only. and They don't really know how to help um yeah. these clients or the don't have the time because, yeah 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 and so i mean it's building great relationships with those referring mm -hmm. vets and if those vets weren't referring to you you can be sure when when this gets yeah. lifted they are going to be referring to you afterwards you know um and if they are referring to you you know you want to offer them your support um and those people that you're helping for free they eventually will be your clients um, right. so those ones will transition into clients because of you know the services that you've offered and and how you're helping so i thought that was a really really great idea of something to do and um especially those people that are not consulting at all now so there are a lot of vet rehabbers that have got quite a lot of time on their hands yeah um and this is a great way to actually use this time to network to market and to show people that how much you know we all care um because we do you know and sometimes you get even more creative when you're stuck in these situations, kind of bright ideas come up or you're in their home and maybe they are showing you around and where the dog is having problems and you can see that visual and you're like, oh, you know what? 
I have found that with some of my hospice vets that we work it with because they're in the owner's home. They're like, oh, this isn't something they talked to you about because you didn't happen to mention that this yes. is a problem, but this is something that we can fix. You know, the dog beds or the runways or, yeah. hey, are you feel, feeding from an elevated bowl? There's so much, there's so much that we can do. And I, and I think that, again, like you said, we have time on our hands and this is going to help our morale. It's going to help our um, anxiety and our stress levels too, because we're helping others. We're, we're, we have a purpose then and, and let's help each other for sure. Yeah. And I think also, you know, chatting about um, those things, maybe that they didn't mention. I think also a lot of these things get brought up in the very first consult and there's completely overwhelm, you know, Mm -hmm. you might've told them to do something. And then when you go and check on them, you don't, like check on them to say, Oh, did you raise that food bowl? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and then you're there in the house and you say, Oh, do you remember we spoke about that? And they're like, Oh, I've, I completely yeah. forgot. Um, so there's probably a lot, like you say, a lot of things that we can pick up um, being in their home. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to chat to you about, and, I, and I'm not sure if there's any research on this, um, but I, I'm not sure how you guys are handling it. So what do you think about the pet having any virus on them? So like, are you like wiping down the pets before they come in? Because I mean, that's obviously a thing. If somebody's touching the pet, right. um, you never know. Um, they could... Or they're breathing it in, it's in their nose. You know, it's it's one of those things that you have to be aware of. Realistically, we should be asking all of our clients if there's exposure, if anybody's sick in the house. I know at the ER that I uh, that I do relief at is they're asking that question, and the animal has to be bathed before they can be seen if there's anybody sick in the house. Um, okay. we're, we're trying to again lessen it by not allowing the collars and leashes and things like that in. Mm-hmm. Uh, washing our hands, not touching our face, trying to just be as careful as possible. But yeah, you should be asking. And sick people shouldn't be bringing their pet in. You should have somebody else bring them in. But we should be aware of that because, again, even if it, the animal can't get it, you know, and they're still doing studies on that, but they've not shown that any dogs have truly become sick with the disease, they can be a reservoir. You know, you, the yeah, owner sneezes yeah. on the dog and then you pet that dog. It's, exactly. it's certainly something to worry about. So washing your hands, not touching your face, and, and trying to keep as sterile of a, of a situation as possible all we can do but again that's why we're talking about separating our teams and why we're have bare bones in our exam rooms because we're trying to just reduce the risk of exposure as much as you can yeah and and then are you like after each um consult is there like a, a protocol to clean clean the room i mean obviously we normally wipe counters and do cleaning in between patients but maybe it's a little bit more hectic now. Yeah, we're using bleach and Clorox wipes and Lysol. We're bleaching all of our harnesses and leashes and collars. Um, Anything that can't be bleached is getting machine washed. So they have a whole protocol again. We have, we're using um, dishwashing gloves just because the amount of gloves that we were going through, we're trying to reserve the PPE for medical hospitals and things like that. But the, the gloves will hold up a little bit longer with bleach and we each have our own so that you only are using your gloves and your stuff. So that way, when they're using all of these bleach products and things like that, um, they're just protecting. I'll say one fun thing is that we're not wearing uniforms right now. We can kind of wear whatever we want, A, because we don't see yeah. clients, and B, because we're working with so much bleach. They didn't want to ruin our uniforms. So that's kind of a fun <laughs> thing. So you know what come out of it. Yeah. So you can ruin your own clothes with right. all the bleach. Exactly. <laughs> all got those clothes the super comfy clothes that you know you don't want to go to the store in because they're all yeah, yeah. stained up and eh, wear them to work <laughs> the dogs don't care and tell me how um how is it making the appointments because that's something that i must i must think like for me i think that must be a problem you know because normally the client comes out the consult room they pay and they make the next appointment um and so like in between patients doing that on the telephone trying to work out who's taking the dog, who's bringing it in, you know, I sort of feel like we actually are going to need, if we're going to be doing this, an extra team member. Yeah, Um, for sure. And that's what we have. Yeah. Yes. Because one person's responsible for running. The reception is responsible for taking payment, making appointments and, and anybody can help grab a phone if, if they need it. You know, we have a little bit more downtime in between patients because of that. Um, so yeah, we have schedules. So usually most of our patients have an eight to 10 week schedule. So we can use that schedule to kind of schedule them out. A lot of our clients will do that. Some of them will do week by week. 
but for the most part, our clients are, are scheduled out in chunks, which makes it a little bit easier for us. But usually when they're taking payment, they ask them if they need to schedule any appointments and they just grab the calendar from the record and, and look at that and help them schedule that. Or sometimes they'll call them back and say, hey, you know, I'm busy right now. Let me give you a call back once you get home and we'll kind of schedule your next couple appointments. They've, they're yeah. so used to the flow of how we do it. It's just now on the phone versus um, in, in person. It's just hard when you have four people, like we have two doctors and two therapists today. So potentially four patients are moving in and out, um, that can get a bit hectic because they have to call when they get here, call to get payment, call when they're ready to leave. So there's a lot more there. I think when we go to the teams, it'll be easier because it's only going to be one doctor, one therapist that are that we're going to have to be balancing. It sounds like we can expect an a increase in our phone bills. Yes. <laughs> <all> the phones. <laughs> For sure. Definitely more time on the phone. And even the little things like how do you wear a mask and talk on the phone? Like it's just so many little things that you have to think about now throughout your day that it's different. We have lines on the floor that like for our computer stations, um, both at the front desk and then in the back, there's red tape what signifies six feet. So you have to move your chair and make sure you're six feet away from the person who's in the other computer next to you. Just little things like that, but little reminders that help us um, try and do our part to scooch over a little bit more yeah we are speaking about telemedicine um and you know i think that um i think it's it's something that is has been coming into veterinary definitely and Mm -hmm. into human medicine but i don't think it's something that us vet rehabbers have really embraced and and i think a lot of us have maybe been using it now um, and thinking like we're going to use this during lockdown but part of me thinks that this is actually the way that we're going to go. We're still going to be doing telemedicine consults because, I mean, there are people that, for example, like older clients that are completely isolating themselves. Mm-hmm. They may be those clients that will still, even once the restrictions are lifted, maybe be too nervous to come in and still yeah. need assistance. Um, and so I, th- I think telemedicine is actually going to be part of our consulting. It's going to be something that we still offer. That, and that's just my personal opinion. So what do you think about that? I think I, if I had my way, I wouldn't only because I like to get my hands on the patients. I like them to be in front of me. I like to be able to interact directly with the client, feel this muscle, feel how this feels, look how this is. And it's, it's something that's lost in telemedicine. I think certain things like, hey, I'm doing these and I want to review exercises with you. Telemedicine is going to be great. Or, hey, my dog is doing this weird thing at home. I want you to look at it. Great. Telemedicine is great. So I think check-ins and and things like that, I think will be good, but it's not going to ever substitute, in my opinion, um, having that animal in front of you and having that owner there to be actively engaged. But I know that I'm a little bit different than some, and I just, I really like to have that owner there and feeling and seeing. I think that that's how I learn. And so I want my clients to have that same experience that I have. I think we all like that. So I think that for us, vet rehabbers, the telemedicine is so difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, chatting to some other vet rehabbers, you know, um, they were like the first time they did a telemedicine consult, they just, they didn't know how to do things. They were like, I'm just so used to like just sitting on the floor, you know, holding onto the Mm -hmm. dog and then just talking and palpating and and doing my thing. And now I'm like behind the screen. And yeah, Yeah. so I I think that, I think if all of us had the choice, we wouldn't be doing them. But And that's why we're setting ours up the way we are, that we're doing it in person with the pet in front of us. And then we're having them do it at home. So it's, it's as close as we can get to having our hands on that specific patient, playing with things, tweaking things, and then having them repeat that at home. So what I was going to do is a 30 minute appointment in house and then a 30 minute appointment one to three days later, just so that they have a chance to kind of review it, kind of get their hands on it. Now, client compliance is hard on a good day. Um, We'll see how it turns out, but I want to give them a chance to, to do it rather than spending 20 minutes of our 30 minute telemedicine consult being like, wait, what did you say? What was this? Where did you want me to put my hand? You know, I want them to, to have reviewed the material and, and, try to get a better handle of it so that we can use that time more wisely. I don't want to waste their money fumbling. Yeah. You know. What's quite nice with it is that you can record your session. So, yeah. because it is overwhelming for them. And, um, you know, you, most of the time we want to spend a lot of time with them, 
but mm -hmm. our, our time is restricted. So it's quite nice that those telemeds and things, we can record them and then yeah. we can send them the recording and they can and actually they can go review over it again. And have it, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. When I used to teach massages to begin with, I'd always encourage my clients to um, record it so that they could have it and review it. I think it's, again, yeah. a good way for me to do things and I, I can do it and then come back to it and then watch the video again and be like, okay, what did I miss? What did I do? I think the hardest or the biggest challenge with that is trying to figure out how to get them these videos that are so big, you know, teaching NMES. We have a patient that we're going to be teaching NMES on um, telemedicine too, which is another great therapy for them to do at home. Um, yeah. it's, it's a 15 minute clip. Are we going to do a bunch of five minute clips? I think we're leaning more towards YouTube to send these videos, but it, you can't Gmail them. You can Dropbox them, but and you have to have an account to do Dropbox. There's, it's just so many little things about trying to fit, you know, Google Drive, but that'll get filled up quick unless you pay for, you know, you're always going to have to pay for some, some service to help get you the videos to the clients, but that's going to be what we figure great, out There's a great website called wetransfer.com and you can actually send two gigs for free. And so you, you basically go, it's W E T R A N S F E R.com. Mm -hmm. And then you attach the file and then it, it, you put the email addresses in and then you get an email to whoever you're sending it to and there's a button to download the files. Um, so that's a great way to, to yeah. send. And otherwise the YouTube, you can also um, load um, videos onto YouTube. And then if you make them unlisted. Yeah, that's that what we said. Yeah, that no one can actually see them unless you've got the link. Um, so that is another way to do it. Yeah, because we looked at Vimeo, but again, you run out of storage pretty quick. So yeah, if, if you have those are great. The Zoom, we're probably going to do Zoom or House Party or even FaceTime for people who have Apple. Um, you just have to figure out what's going to work best for you and your clients. But again, so many people are doing Zoom parties and house parties now. Uh, I think most people have these downloaded and it's a lot easier for them to, to figure out. The Zoom recordings are actually quite small. So once you like get the recording, the number of megabytes is actually quite little in comparison to if you film like with your phone and then try and send it. Um, so on the phone, especially, it can get quite high. You can go up mm -hmm. to you know a gig or half a gig quite quite easily. Absolutely, it's it's. I think we're going to keep seeing changes, and we just have to do our best to adapt. And but I think as vet rehabbers, we're the best at that, right? Because we're always having to think outside of the box and, and come up with new ideas and, and keep up on changing things because none of our patients are ever going to follow the same two rules. Yeah. I think the important thing is that we just got to be prepared for things. Mm -hmm. And so, and to plan, um, to go into a situation where the restrictions are lifted and then we're suddenly saying, Oh no, like how are we going to do this? You know? Yeah. Um, so what you shared, I think has been really, really helpful um, for, for the people that are now completely in lockdown. Mm -hmm. They've got a little bit of an idea uh, of the way in which they can do things. And they're going to start to think about all the systems that they're going to have to change. So thank you for, for sharing. Absolutely. And I think the veterinary community is wonderful. And I think, you know, we just need to support each other through this time and as things change yeah. and, and offer ideas and reach out to other people to see what their ideas are. You know, like we said, you're in England right now, reach out to America. If you're in Canada, reach out to South Africa. We need to reach out to each other and, and support each other during this. Yeah, because I think also we all have some great ideas. Mm -hmm. So when we share them, we can all use them. So Absolutely. Thank you so much for your Absolutely. time. I really appreciate it. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Vet Rehabbers, for more information on how to take your career to the next level, go to www.onlinepetalt.com. Please don't forget to subscribe to my podcast so you'll get notified. I'm here every single week talking to vet rehabbers from all over the world, learning, and I would love you to join me. Hope you have an awesome day further. Cheers for now.